This is Adam Wasserman, and you're listening to the Matt Balaker Podcast. Hello, fine people out there. Thank you for tuning in to the Matt Balaker Podcast. Uh, today's guest is a street baller, property manager, and owner of the Grand Comedy Club in Escondido, California. Please welcome Adam Wasserman to the program. How are you doing, Adam? Hey there. How are you doing, Matt? Good to see you. Uh, good to see you. And, and, you know, we've chatted a lot about San Diego and, and San Diego sports, but I'm not sure if you, like, grew up there. Where, where did you grow up? Originally from Wisconsin, uh, moved here when I was young, uh, moved to San Diego when I was seven, 1979. So I've been here most of my life and down in San Diego, East County, and then back up uh, here to North County where my comedy club is uh, since the mid 80s. All right. So you're, you're born a Badger. You moved westward. Uh, what were your first memories of San Diego? Well, we thought we were moving to the beach. We had visited <laughs> once and we went to Disneyland and mission beach and we thought oh my god we're moving to san diego we're rich we're rich because we're moving to san diego and we're at the beach every day and then we moved then we moved to el cajon uh which is 35 minutes from the beach uh and it's like back then it was like redneck town for sure i think it still might be but uh yeah we moved to el cajon and it was not near the beach it was 110 (laughs) degrees and we did have a pool though so we felt rich because we had a pool um but yeah, El Cajon is like used to be kind of the armpit of San Diego, and uh, but we loved it. We played Pop Warner football and baseball, and had a great time. Yeah, like you know, if you're able to play football in El Cajon, you can play football in most places. It's 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 a little warmer, more inland. Um, what were the first? You mentioned Pop Warner. What what position did you play, Adam? Um, so back then, you could lie. They didn't even like check birth certificates. My dad. <laughs> Uh-oh. My dad said I was eight years old. You had to be eight to start Pop Warner. My dad lied and said I was eight when I was seven. And, oh, Jesus, I got somebody calling in. Get get rid of this phone call message. Goodbye. Um, that's what happens when you're opening a new comedy club. My phone's ringing all the time. Um, so my dad lied, said I was eight. What's funny is my my one of my best buddies growing up, Shane Spencer, played for the Yankees, uh, won World Series with him. His dad also lied. He was also seven like me. So the first year we played, we played um, – with the older kids and I think I was a right guard and Shane says he's a running back. Shane was one of the best football players and baseball players in San Diego County since we were kids. And uh, he swears he was a running back. I'm like, dude, you and I were both offensive linemen when we were seven years old, they, you know, cause we were young. He's like, I never played offense line to this day. He swears by it, but I was like a right guard. And then the next year we were actually eight. And so then we were, you know, pretty good for our age. So then I was a quarterback and he was a running back and safety. And I was also a linebacker. So all through pop Warner, um, uh, he was a running back in safety and I was a linebacker and quarterback and we played all, we played in a couple, um, championship. We won the San Diego County one year. We lost the County another way. Um, yeah. So we had a really good team all the way through pop Warner. So Adam, it sounds like the key to, uh, youth football success is lying. You gotta lie. Yeah. You gotta lie and get in there early. Get that, get those concussions when you're young. That way, you know, you get used to them uh, when you're, you know, 12, 13, 15. You, you got to get them in your system. Yeah. That way you can shake them off a little faster. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I remember uh, I'm from Carlsbad and Danny Amante was a big deal. Cause it was the Oceanside uh, little league world series team was playing against his team. And that was kind of like the opposite side of line where he was, I think 14 or 15 at the time uh yeah playing with 12 year olds so i think what you did is a lot more morally correct what say you? yes danny danny had his wife and kids out in the car in the parking lot (laughs) so that was the dead giveaway when he's like they they drove in the winnebago yeah yeah Yeah. so my dad was a football maniac so um i don't think you can get away with any of that stuff now now they check they check everything, the birth certificates, and they want everything. I mean, they, they check everything. It used to be weight and age. Back then was weight and age. So my dad was coaching some of the pop, my brother's teams, and there would be like a really good stud kid, but he's small. My dad would have to put uh, weights in his girdle, like before the weigh-ins. He wouldn't even qualify because he'd be like 100 pounds, and he'd have to be 115. So they put weights in his girdle, and he would bring him two milkshakes to drink before the the game to try to just get those extra pounds on before the weigh-ins because uh they had the weight limits both both too low and too high back then in pop warner oh no i i remember weigh-ins i was a like 
tall, lanky kid. So I was always on like the higher end of the weight spectrum. And I remember spitting. I think I missed a game, but you know, just the, the stress and the sweat you have walking up the scale. Yeah. was like everyone's watching you. And I remember I think yeah. I had to take off my shoulder pads and just watch. And I was like, all right, yeah. no, no more pizza yeah. this week. It was, it was uh, yeah. exactly. I'm in therapy for it now. But you, you mentioned high school. Uh, what, what high school did you attend? So I ended up moving from East County to uh, North County to San Marcos. Actually, my uh, kids went there as well. My my son was there up until last semester. Uh, but yeah, I went to San Marcos uh, High School in North County here, not far from where the comedy club is, not far from my house here in Carlsbad. And I uh, graduated in 1990. So San Marcos back then wasn't too bad. Um, now it's now it's been redone. It looks like a college. It looks like a, a you know a junior college or something. But when I went there, it was not terrible, but not great, um, you know. Yeah, that was our, part our, of the. Our, go ahead. Our claim to fame, our only sports claim to fame back then, was uh, Rick Ebert. Uh, in like '88, he was our quarterback, and um, he played. He went to Notre Dame, and he was like the third string quarterback at Notre Dame. So back then, it was like, wow, we know, like we watch on TV. The Rick Ebert got in. Uh, we had nobody really famous sports wise out of San Marcos. Uh, our, our our claim to fame was our pregnancy rate back then. Uh, <laughs> And I had nothing to do with that, unfortunately. <laughs> but that was our claim to fame for San Diego County was our pregnancy rate. But Rick Eber played played for wait, the, wait, wait, the wait. claim to fame was the pregnancy rate was so low. Is that is that what you're saying, or or what what, what are you no, what are you no, getting no. at? <laughs> no, 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 no. It was uh, it was high apparently. Uh, there's a whole story behind that where I guess we reported our real numbers when you, you don't have to or something. They had some story about it, but yeah. Anytime you see, see somebody from San Diego County. You say San Marcos High School. That's my age. They go, oh yeah, the pregnancy rate. You're like, okay, whatever, man. That's a, that's not worth it. <laughs> hey, lo- lower GPAs, higher pregnancy rates. We all have to be good at something. So that that was a, I, I mean, maybe not in San Marcos, but that was a time. Gosh, I think Junior Sale played. I mean, he was at Oceanside, and who was that guy who was? Uh, I think he won the Heisman uh, at Colorado. And unfortunately, he passed away. Well, I'm blanking on his name. Um, Yes, uh, Sal Anisi. Sal Anisi, yeah. W- 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 he was out my timeline correct? Out Vista. I think he was Vista. Was he Vista or El Camino? So my kid plays at El Camino now. I think Sal Anisi might have been Vista. Vista was dominant. Uh, say I graduated in 80, 85. My dad coached at Oceanside High for five years after Say I left. So my dad was there like 86 to 91. He actually coached against me. We lived in an apartment. My parents got divorced. We lived in an apartment together in San Marcos. My dad actually had like VHS tapes of Oceanside stuff. And I had VHS tapes of San Marcos stuff. And we're like, all right, just don't look at my tapes. I won't look at yours. <laughs> so he actually coached against me for a couple of years, but um, he coached. And those Oceanside teams were really good back then. The year after say I left, they were uh, number one and number two in the state all the time playing against modern day in Orange County. I went to some oh. of those games because on Saturdays and on the sideline, and I couldn't even believe the size and speed of these guys in high school. I couldn't even believe they were my age. Like I was, I was a junior in high school, maybe doing the chains at, at modern day. And I couldn't even believe these were kids that I potentially could, should have been playing against. It, it was su- such another level of football. Well, that's because their fathers said they were eight when they were really like six. Yeah. And so they, yeah. they had a, yeah. a leg up on you. Uh, now, a- after high school, did you pursue athletics in school, I I, I, I want to. I'm curious how you got into street ball. So where where, where did where did this? Uh, no, I just always liked basketball. Like basketball. I was yeah, I always liked basketball. I played football. I played one year of baseball in high school. I never played, but playing pickup basketball in the off time in the high school was like a main thing. You know, we used to play nine foot hoops because um, you can just dunk on your friends. And literally, you play two hours on the weekends and weekdays. Um, nine foot basketball, you're just constantly trying to dunk your friends. We used to have our own dunk competitions. So you're constantly jumping, jumping, jumping. Well, that leads to going to college and playing pickup basketball. When I went to San Diego state playing behind Peterson gym, um, playing almost every day and then leagues and rec leagues and the YMCA and mission Valley, et cetera. Um, pretty soon, um, you know, doing that nine foot, even down after during college, we used to play nine foot dunk ball down in, uh, La, uh bird rock in La Jolla and La Jolla shores at some of the elementary schools. Um, that, you, you know, I ended up getting pretty good at basketball. Um, that's actually my only claim to fame for college recruiting. I'm like a third year at San Diego state, but I already had taken enough basketball classes just to get gym time that I took one at Mesa college, a junior college. So we drive over there because you got gym time and, and there were great games and good players. And the, the Mesa college basketball coach came up to me and said, Hey son, he said, uh, you're pretty good there. He goes, uh, you ever think about trying out for the team? I said, hey, man, I'm like uh, 20, 
21 years old. I've been in college three years. And he goes, all right, forget I he goes, forget I said anything. See, you, see you later. And he walked away. I was like, <laughs> hey, technically I got recruited for college guys. I got recruited. So I, that that counts as recruitment. I mean, n- now you could have hey. joined the the and one tour or something. There there are more outlets yeah. for for street yeah. ball legends. Now, when yeah. was the first time you could dunk on a 10 foot rim? Probably maybe first year in college. I grew I was a late bloomer, so I was growing even into college. So I would say I'm like six feet tall or just a, a smidge under. Probably first year in college. Some of the hoops you'll go to a place it'll be like nine foot, ten, nine, nine, but it's outdoor and blacktop. So in a gym with a with a stringy floor, ten foot, probably like my freshman year in uh in college. And that was my claim to fame then, because anytime you go any pickup, you know, I play pickup basketball in Chicago, New York, Milwaukee on trips, Florida, just all over the place. If you're able to go out in the park in warm ups and just like throw one down, then you're going to get picked up quicker, especially as a chubby white guy. <laughs> like uh, you may not get picked up that quick unless you show, you know, because you could sit and wait and have these guys skip over you. Um, so if I could warm up a little bit and throw one down or at least come close to it, then they'll be like, all right, maybe I get picked up quicker on the team. You're like Luca, but hops, hops. I, I, yeah. I like that. Yeah. So, how, how is streetball different in the various cities? Uh, well, I mean, I, the most I played here in San Diego at PB Rec, La Jolla Rec. Actually, I still play with some of those guys, uh, the La Jolla Rec guys. I've been down there. Now I'm playing up here in Cardiff on Saturdays with guys more age appropriate, uh, and they play <laughs> half court, which which makes me be able to walk on on Sundays. Otherwise, the full court. I can play indoor full court a little bit, but outdoors rough on the knees. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean playing La Jolla, uh, La Jolla Saturday mornings pickup ball and PB is a little bit different than like Milwaukee, like yeah, you know pickup. So it can be a little, a little more ruthless. Uh, you know, I haven't you know, I haven't played out of state in a while, but uh, yeah, it's a little more, a little more hardcore trying to play a little more. Uh, how do you say urban? A little more urban. Yeah, where where is the most ruthless place you've played? Uh, you know, Marquette was in a gym in Milwaukee, probably like Chicago, like when I was younger on trips, you know, to go watch um, whether my buddy who played pro baseball, go watch him play against the Cubs or or whatever. Um, I'd go bring my shoes and go try to play a few of those places and try to find, all right, well, where's the place to go? You know what I mean? That's not you know too scary, but but enough where I can go play. So probably Chicago, a couple, couple parks there that I went to that I'm, afterwards I'm like, ah, maybe I shouldn't have went here alone to play basketball because, you know, basketball game gets competitive. You bump into a guy. Next thing you know, you bump into the wrong guy. Or you, you know what I mean? Like uh, you got to be a little careful. You got, you got to be careful. You, you got you got to move back to either El Cajon or somewhere in the San Diego area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, come back, come back. Yeah. You you have a knack for for meeting people. Like you said, you're you're kind of the Forrest Gump of San Diego. And I remember chatting with you about some run-ins you had with Junior Seau. And this was yeah. uh, you know um, I think what was it? What is that? His restaurant. I mean, can you can you take us back to those those times a little bit? Yeah. So Junior, my first job. Actually, I was still in college. I had a sales job. Uh, down in La Jolla, and my the owner of the company is the guy I played softball with. He was neighbors with Junior Sal. He was good buddies with them. So he on our softball team. He said, "Oh, Junior and Al Papunu, who's the tight end for the Chargers, they're going to be on our softball team." And I was like, "Sal's never going to show up for softball in Poway, right? Like he's going to get hurt or something. He's never going to play." And uh, Papunu actually played. Like he was one of the best tight ends in the NFL, and he was showing up on Tuesday night softball wearing like his high tops. He had no cleats on. He played a few games for us, but Sal never showed up. Uh, but I did golf with him a couple of times uh, with my old boss and um, hung out with him. And then uh, the final, the thing at Seau's restaurant after a Packers game, some friends of mine from Wisconsin were in town. We went to Seau's. They had converted the cigar bar to a sushi bar. And we've been having beers all day long in the game. And, and we saw him. I said, hey, what's up? And he sort of remembered me. And I said, if I could bring my friends from Wisconsin to meet you, they would lose their minds. He said, I'll bring them in anytime. So next thing you know, three hours later, we're just like doing shots, hanging out with Junior um, in the sidebar. And there's a guy playing ukulele, and there's people eating sushi. There might have been 20 people in there. And then I said, hey, you ever thought about putting a comedy show on here? I kind of been doing stand-up for a couple of years. Um, I put on these shows and bars. And he said, oh, we used to have this one guy did, do it, but it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't very good. So he said, you, you think you're funny? Are you funny? And I said, well, I hope so. I've been doing stand-up for a couple of years. He said, uh, well, go up on stage right now. I'll, I'll introduce you. Go up on stage. So the more he drank, uh, in hindsight, he was a little 
whatever. He was a little off, obviously, uh, at the time, because it was only a few months later that he ended up taking his own life. But he was challenging me. Like, he kept challenging me, and kind of like this type A personality, like, because I like to talk, he likes to talk. And he was sort of didn't like me stepping on his toes or whatever. And I, you know, so he kept challenging me to do comedy. And I said, uh, Junior, I go, I'm wearing a hoodie. These people are in sushi. That's not how comedy works. Like, I'm not going to look in a bomb in front of these 20 people right now. But then he kept saying it. Like, the third time, I finally, he said it to me and kind of laughed when I said no. He looked at my friends. He goes, oh, yeah, he said he was funny. And I, I looked at my buddies. I stood up. I took my hoodie off. I said, you know what, Junior? Let's do it. I said, let's do it. Introduce me right now. Let's do this. He goes, oh, yeah, really? All right. So we see how all 6'3", 250 pounds of him stands up. Uh, and I look at my buddies. I said, I'm about to bomb so hard on stage right now. But it's going to be for a great story. You guys are here from Wisconsin, and, and a Hall of Famer is going to introduce me. And so he goes on stage, kicks the ukulele guy off. He says, this guy, you know, is a Packer fan, and da 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 give it up for Adam. I go on stage, and I might have done three and a half minutes of comedy. Like, I'm doing my Prius jokes and some of this, these old jokes I used to do. And I'm bombing. Besides my few friends laughing, people are just eating sushi, looking like, what is going on right now? Like, this is a quiet <laughs> sushi restaurant. And this guy who's drunk, wearing a Packers shirt, and uh, and then like the DJ after four minutes, the DJ played like a wah wah wah, and I was like, oh, okay, fuck you, DJ. And uh, so I went off stage. My friends started clapping, and then he went on stage all happy. Hey, that's what we do here in the garage. He called it the garage. We just do crazy things and put comedians up. And uh, and then he came back, and then he was you know angry with me, not angry, but still kind of a jerk with me at the end. So I made jokes about you know, hey man. I'm going to get in a fight with Junior Seau, and then you gotta, we'll run out to the car, you know, jokingly. My friend, he'll kill you. I'm like, no, I'm just kidding. I'm never going to fight Junior Seau. He was one of my idols. He was like my hero growing up in North County as a linebacker. I mean, he was and going to USC. I mean, the guy was the man. He's, he's an awesome dude. So uh, you, you cut your teeth at the garage at Seau's restaurant, and then you end up starting your own club. Why'd you do yeah. that? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm questioning it now every day that we're moving to the new place. Uh, no, so I just stand up part time. I always kept my regular job, and then um, after a few years, I was putting on shows. You know, people always told me, um, you know, host your own show at a bar or some other place. That way, you get more stage time. You can network and get on other people's shows. So I had a few uh, different sh uh, shows at bars going on, mm -hmm. and then a friend of mine opened a club in Temecula, Marietta, actually. Um, Rocky opened Aces out there with another partner, and so I used to go up there and host and and help him out and get stage time. And then I would fill in for him when he wanted a night off. I'm like, dude, I'll seat people and whatever and kind of run things. So I used to help him out. Eventually, I bought his partner out. She couldn't spend as much time there. She had kids. So I bought her out. So I owned uh, half of that place for about, I don't know, a year and a half, two years. Um, and then I was busy and, and uh, we had some issues, partnership issues. So I, uh, I ended up, he ended up buying me out of there, thank God. So I got my money out of there, came back. And I had been looking for years. Uh, I've been looking at locations here at the coast inland in Escondido where where my mom has a business and and where I lived in high school um and then I found this place so 5 years ago we opened Grand Comedy Club and Pizzeria um so we've been open 5 years we opened right before covid which was great we were doing great for a few months uh and then we had to shut down and then I had the patio the outdoor space held like 65 70 people so we were doing outdoor shows during covid which was really good because um it gave people something to do and then also comedians in LA were coming down because they would, things were closed down um, up there. So I, next thing you know, I'm getting messages from Neil Brennan and Eric Griffin and Ian Bag. And so the only silver lining for me for COVID was because of the patio space, I probably got more comedians, famous comedians, than I would have um, had I not had not been COVID, not LA not been shut down. So now, you know, I text Neil Brennan and I text Eric Griffin, hey guys, you got any dates? You want to come down? Um, and they pick and choose their dates and they love our club. And since we're not in San Diego, there's five clubs competing in San Diego. I'm up here in North County, um, so we're sort of in this no man's land zone, closer to LA. So yeah. for the most part, you know, I don't compete with the comedy store. I'm friends with Mike Vin. I'm friends with all the comedy store people. Um, we're far enough away; we don't compete. Uh, they have, um, they have uh, Dustin Ibarra. Uh, a few months later, I'll have Dustin Ibarra because it's not relevant because it's so far away. Mm -hmm. So thank you, COVID, for helping launch the Grand Comedy Club. Yes. COVID was great for one reason for one reason only is that to for me to get bigger some bigger names. Well, Ian Bag might not have been texting you otherwise. So there's 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 a silver lining. Now, what was it about Escondido? You mentioned your mom had a business there, but um, when you were like scouting locations, did you just that was available, or kind of what was it that made you sign on the dotted line? 
So I do my taxes. I was there yesterday. I do my taxes downtown Escondido on Grand uh, with the same same guy for did my parents' taxes for 40 years, whatever. And I next door was a pizzeria. I used to get a slice for him before we sat down to do our taxes. And five, whatever, and a half years ago, doing my taxes, I went to get a slice. The place was closed. And I'm like, what the heck? So I went over there and I said, oh, the pizza place closed. I couldn't get you a slice. But I always had this pizza recipe from a friend of mine in Wisconsin, this famous pizza place um, it's called Sammy's in Wisconsin and Minnesota. That's the best pizza in the world. Um, and I always thought, oh, I wonder if this pizza would take off if I had a very similar pizza here. So I happened to call the guy, hey, what's the cost to rent a pizzeria? Just out of curiosity. And he said, oh, I also have this big room in the back, like a big banquet room. And that was like, oh, really? So um, between the the ingredients in this pizza, you know, the recipe I have for this pizza, that's famous in the Midwest. And the back room being like, you know, low ceilings, great for comedy. Um, I was like, wow, this might work. So kind of went back and forth. And next thing you know, I'm opening the comedy club by myself. And I've been regretting it ever since. No, I'm just kidding. It's It's been fine. It's been fine. It's a lot of work. Uh, the, the new location, I'm going to have to hire a manager so I don't have to uh, stress out every day and do everything myself. I literally do everything from put the the shows on the website. I book the comedians, put the shows on the website. Do everything, marketing, Facebook, I do everything. So now I'm starting to to get uh, channel things off and get a manager and have people do some things for me. Marketing person, help me a little bit and do some of the stuff. So you don't you don't have to do it all yourself. And what's something that I guess surprised you the most about launching your own club? Surprised me the most? I you know, I'm sort of a people person. Like I'm fine. I get along with most people unless those people are assholes. So then um then I really don't like uh, being like the public, interacting with the public. Most of our customers are awesome. I'd say like 99%, but mm-hmm. um, it's, I feel like every couple of weeks there's like a Karen that just rolls in. And there was one this week. I was I went to the club before the Friday night shows to like make sure things were handled before I went to my kid's football, football game. And uh, this lady was just, she's in the pizzeria trying to order pizza. And then he's trying to explain like, no, you go in the comedy club and you order the pizza. And then that counts to your two item minimum. And and she was just looking, well, can I just get it from you to my pizza guy? And I, I came in. I tried to be nice. Mm-hmm. So uh, she was not getting it. I said, he's a pizza guy. He doesn't take orders. Those people take the orders. He makes the pizza. And it took me like seven minutes to finally just like – so dealing with people like Karens like that every now and then make me just go like, oh, I need to hire a manager. I'll go hide in the back with the comedians. Do what I like <laughs> to do is talk talk to comedians and have a beer and laugh and talk about comedy and jokes and like the process and things like that are what I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Um, But dealing with like certain, again, 99% of the clients are really cool and they appreciate the club. They thank me for opening the club. Um, They love the place, but there's 1% of just like, why did I do this to myself? I'm getting customer service emails about some bullshit about their breadsticks being too dry. (laughs) Yeah. Dealing with annoying customers is probably not the reason you, uh, you took the time and money and effort to do this, but you, you mentioned um, joke writing and the comedy process. Who were some of the comedians you looked up to when you were growing up? Well, obviously at my age group at around 12, 11, 12 is when like Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, a lot of that stuff we were able to watch on like HBO or the illegal black box HBO delirious raw, um, the, the Richard Pryor live in the sunset strip. Um, some people have the albums, but I remember seeing that stuff and just it was amazing. George Carlin um, had HBO specials back then and the albums. Um, so those three were probably the most influential. My first co- live comedy show I ever saw uh, in person. Um, oh, also the the Rodney Dangerfield um, Young Comedian special. Oh yeah, uh, we didn't even have, we we didn't even have a VCR back then. We had to go to Blockbuster rent the VCR when I was in seventh grade. And then you get the pick this. And we watched that tape over and over and over again and memorized all the bits. And it was hilarious. Uh, but my first live comedy show ever, I was a freshman at San Diego State. And we were going to Laughlin. We were doing a family trip in motorhomes to go out to like Havasu and Laughlin for Thanksgiving or mm-hmm. Havasu. And the weather was bad. So we couldn't really do it because it was raining all weekend and windy. So we ended up going to Laughlin. And on the sign, it says George Carlin live, two or three shows Thanksgiving. And I was like, and I go, what? George Carlin, I'm 18 years old. My mom goes, oh, you like George Carlin? I'm like, yeah, I love him. She goes, so do I. You want to go to the show? And the rest of the family in the motor room, no one else wanted to go. So my first live sh- – and I was also on crutches because I rolled my ankle playing basketball like two days before that. So we went to the at matinee show. We go up to the ticket window, and they go, oh, you're on crutches, so we'll give you handicap seating. And they put me in the first row <laughs> with my mom to watch George. So George Carlin's like right here. 
um, at the Riverside, Don Lothan's Riverside Resort, whatever it is, uh, first row. And then I, they, it was amazing. I, it was like my first live comedy show was George Carlin with my mom. And they also said, hey, sir, can I get you a beer? And I looked at my mom, I'm 18. I'm like, yeah, can I get a Heineken? And my mom didn't say anything. I was like, sweet. So I started <laughs> drinking Heinekens with my mom there. I was like, hell yeah, <laughs> this is great. So, so the first beer you ever had was at a George Carlin show with your mom in Laughlin. No, 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 no. <laughs> I had like a thousand, thousand beers before that. That was the first one in front of my mom. And she didn't bat an eyelash. So what kind of motivated you to go from watching George Carlin to picking up the mic yourself? I, you know, I, I think it was always, I was always kind of funny and I was on my butt. I just like the art form. I've just, it's, it's a, it's a really cool art form that I don't know when I, you know, I, I was always kind of quick witted and funny. And actually when I started writing for stand-up, um, I made a, a a bet with a friend is what Rye finally went on stage and did the open mics the first time. Um, but my other friends were telling me, you won't do it. You won't do it. You're like funny off the cuff, but I don't see you up there. Like, you know, standing, it's, it's different. It's different to be yeah. funny with your friends and quick witted and do whatever, or be crazy enough to make a scene at a, at a bar, do something silly, just to, you know, um, getting on stage with your written material and doing that is totally different, which is true. And they all were like, no, you won't do it. And I was like, what do you mean? And one guy I just actually talked to an hour ago on the phone about, um, some business stuff. Uh, he's the one that said it to me. It made me want to do it even more. Uh, <laughs> but I was, I was scared of public speaking. I, I wrote for like a long time and, and wrote everything out. And then I got scared and didn't do it when I was supposed to do it. And then finally um, I went to the comedy palace and actually Zoltan, who's a good buddy of mine now, who's, who's really blowing up right now. He oh, was yeah. hosting, he was hosting the open mic at the comedy palace, which is now mic drop down in San Diego, off Claremont Mesa there. Um, and uh yeah i did a few minutes i don't know it was three minutes five minutes whatever it was and uh i practiced it so much in my head when it went okay i guess because he said was that really your first time i said yeah he said that was pretty good and i was like oh really it was pretty good so then i was like all in. <laughs> tell me more <laughs> yeah i was like this is easy uh so no then i started doing every show i could and bars and this and that and um and then i just kind of got the bug and i did you know part-time obviously kept my regular job and then was all in for a while then you go in phases where i didn't do shows for a few months i was busy mm -hmm. coaching my kids or doing whatever so i'm in and out even now i'm kind of in and out i hosted shows at my club for like two months straight doing new material and just getting up on stage and doing crowd work and doing material and then you know i was kind of like burnt out on it and didn't have anything new um, written out or anything so i haven't i think i went on stage like three weeks ago for a couple of shows but i really haven't been getting up lately at my own place so how has your comedy changed from the first time at the comedy palace till now how has it changed uh you know i used to be more tied uh tied to the words like a script mm -hmm. um i think at the beginning i was just tied to like this is how you say it to be funny and then if you ever screwed up the words at all it would really screw up the whole joke and your pacing and everything i think now i'm more comfortable um to to be able to kind of retell the joke even though i kind of i know which way it goes retell it kind of live in the way i'm feeling it and i want to tell it um as if i'm talking to you right now mm -hmm. um i think it took me a long time to even figure that out because i thought oh this is the way it's funny you say it exactly like this timing wise punchline you know act out whatever you're doing um and now i'm more comfortable with the fact of here's how the joke goes just kind of say it say it to make it funny as if you're saying it for the first time so you're you're a little more off the cuff, less scripted. I mean, is is that how you write as well? Do you do you get ideas, then you work them out on stage, or what is your writing process like? I put stuff on my phone, and then when like <laughs> say I'm gonna host this weekend, say I'm gonna host. I'm too busy to write. I wish I I always am like I'm gonna write this week. I'm gonna call my buddy Josh Nelson and have a beer and then like write or like do go to the you know go sit at the beach and just like work some of the stuff out so i have some stuff ready for this weekend and, I'll, and then it never happens then i'm driving to the club at five o'clock on a friday and i didn't hire a host and i'm like god i should have hired a host so i don't have to do this <laughs> and i'm looking at my notes and i'm like jotting some stuff down but that actually helped me kind of write on stage more now you need to record yourself to hear back what you said because oftentimes you say something great and you get laughs and then you're like wait what did i say that was or you kind of add in because you're naturally trying to be funny i never record myself because i hate listening to myself but i know i need to do that because all the like pros do that i mean joe rogan like listens records everything listens to everything meticulously goes over it every night all these people do that so i mean if you want to be good at it you need to do that i don't do that that's why i'm not very good at it <laughs> Well, you just have you have a, a different approach, and then, 
you mentioned your your moving locations. What uh, what what can you tell you know the the audience out there, Adam? They're excited. They want to know like where can they see this? Like what what's the story there? So my landlord tried to raise my rent during COVID while we were closed. My landlord is the devil. He's a scumbag. He's an asshole. He is. Uh, I make jokes on stage about like if anyone knows a hitman, feel free to email <laughs> Grand Comedy Club at Gmail. No. He's a terrible person. Uh, I hate him. Um, and then now he's listed our building for the last year. It's been for sale. He thinks this um, this building is worth like millions of dollars. It's not. Um, but besides me wanting to get out of there for that reason, the location where we're at right now is on Grand Avenue. It's downtown Escondido. You kind of got to get off the freeway, go inland, you know, a couple miles and parking in downtown area. Um, so the new area is way better. It's it's a bigger Look, we can have a 200 seats in there. It's right near the freeway parking. It's in the mall. So it used to be a California pizza kitchen in the Escondido oh. mall. Um, so it's a bit easy to get there, easy to park, big location, more seats. It'll be a sports bar seven days a week. I'll have TVs. We'll be doing karaoke on Tuesdays and open mic on Wednesdays and, and trivia on Thursdays or whatever, and then football. And then comedy, of course, at least, you know, Friday, Saturday, if not Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, so, um, the the rent wasn't too much more for a much bigger, better location. Um, I think it's just in seven days a week. We thought with this location, our pizzeria, we do some business during the week. There's five pizzerias in downtown Escondido. They're literally, there's one like right behind us, one across the street. There are three within a block from us. And it's like, you know, pretty, pretty soon we were closed on Mondays. We were closed on Tuesdays, closed on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. Wasn't worth even having many in there. So this place will be kind of multi-purpose. It'll be sports bar. Um, we'll do some really creative things with like Monday Night Football. I'm going to get comedians like Zoltan, for example, although he's too famous now. He's a Steelers fan. I'm a Packers fan. So say they were playing each other. We both have wireless mics. I thought of this years ago before the Manning you know, cast, which mm -hmm. they do on ESPN, where they're sitting there making jokes, talking shit during the games, but also talking football. Um, have comedians do that. You know, Jason Lawhead's a Browns fan. I'm a Packers fan. They're playing each other. We have wireless mics. So you got the sound kind of low. You do your own, you know, jokes and cast, talk about the game and different players and things um, live. And then, you know, when the quarter, when the quarter hits or halftime hits, maybe do a show. Each comedian does seven, 10 minutes, whatever for the halftime show, maybe after the game. Um, so I want to do some creative comedy tied to sports um, things like that at the club too. Uh, if I can find the time, which I never have time to do anything. Nice. Maybe have a dunk contest. At half yeah, time, dunk, maybe. yeah, dunk some wings, dunk some wings into ranch dressing. That's all I can do now is you can <laughs> no dunking, no dunking at 52 years old anymore. Yeah. When was your last dunk? Like not, not with a chicken wing, like with a basketball, you know, I claimed, so I ruptured my Achilles when I was 37. I was on that show pros versus Joe's. Do you remember that show? Oh yeah. I think it was, I was, was on that, that the one Petros Papadakis was. Yes. Was Petros. Still, yeah. Petros was smoking a cigarette on the Rose Bowl, um, at the Rose Bowl down on the field. And I'm walking with him to do the final obstacle course thing. And he's smoking a cigarette. I go, hey, man, can I get a pull off that cigarette? And he goes, sure. And he goes, to hand, I'm like, I'm just kidding. I got to run the ops. I got to run the whole obstacle course right now. I'm just joking. He's, he's kind of a dick, by the way. I don't like that guy. He, he was like roasting us. He, he's one of those guys that could roast you and thought it was really mm -hmm. funny and make everyone laugh. And then when he come back and I'm like, dude, you're a running back. I'm like, I can't believe you're a running back at USC. Like we're teasing him. And then he'd get really mad when you roasted him back. He, he even said to us, uh, he said, uh, Hey, remember when we go into post and we edit this whole thing, I can either make you look cool or make you look like a real asshole. And mm -hmm. I was like, we all looked at each other like, what a dick dude. Like yeah. he's trying to, you know, it was like funny. Cause he was making fun of us. We tried to give back. So, um, it was right after that that aired. I went against John Randall, Mitch Richmond, and John Franco, all Hall of Famers. Had a great time. I lost by like seven seconds to the guy who the the not the gorilla, but the trampoline flip guy for the Phoenix Suns beat me, um, a younger guy. And then uh, I ruptured my Achilles playing flag football. Like two weeks later, uh, my Achilles snapped, and uh, so then that was when I was thirty seven. So I think I might have thrown one down previous to that, maybe. Oh, you okay. know what I did for sure because my audition tape. I did an audition tape at LA Fitness, throwing down a dunk and doing a trick shot. So yeah, it was right on 37. Nice. Well, that, that that's impressive. Aside from dunking, uh, what are you most proud of career-wise, Adam? Career-wise? Oh gosh. Um, you know, I mean, if, if you want to talk about the stand-up stuff, um, I you know, 
having that, you know, starting stand up super late and doing the open mics and kind of building and, and doing well enough to like feature my first big feature gigs. Um, we're at Tommy T's in Pleasanton, the Bay area. I was up there for a Packers game. I got some guest sets. Next thing you know, they booked me for my first like full feature weekend. Um, Guy Tory, I featured for Guy Tory um, for six shows um, at, at Tommy T's in Pleasanton. I was so proud of myself because I worked my way up to be able to feature. Um, uh, and Guy and I are still friends. He's a great dude. Um, although I did bomb uh, horrendously. <laughs> first gig, the first gig uh, on Thursday night. Uh, Tommy T's is near Oakland. And Guy Toy is a, a black gentleman who's a good friend of mine. He was in American History X. And uh, I started off with, like, some crowd work about the Raiders and the Niners. And, like, the Real Housewives of Oakland are over here. And I was getting high fives and standing up on the stage. I was, like, killing it. I'm like, this is going to be great. And I started my regular material. And I started bombing so hard in front of 300-plus people that were just staring at me. And then the phones came out. And the chat at the table started. And I was like, oh, no. And the fear kicked in. Yeah. And it was. It was terrible. So I bombed super hard. Um, but then I bounced back. A guy gave me like, all right, get louder and crazier and dirtier jokes. Well, so I went back to my some of my other material, and I was great for four more shows. And then I bombed again because I was hungover on Sunday. He and I stayed up <laughs> late on Saturday. And I bombed again on Sunday. But but I was pretty proud of that as far as the stand-up and entertainment stuff um, to go from like 37-year-old starting you know, stand-up comic, uh, comedy to like featuring and getting paid thousands of dollars to – Worked with this guy who was an American History X who you know sold out. Um, he got bonus because he sold out every show. Um, I got more money. I think it was really cool to to be involved uh, to to do that. Nice. That, that that's a cool story. And uh, what are you most optimistic about? Well, I've I've been pessimistic lately about the new club. I think we're going to be great. Um, I need more people to know about us in, in North County. There are people that come in the club. Um, that don't even know we're there still. They're like, I live four blocks away and we didn't know you were here and I love comedy. And I'm like, well, how can I advertise? So <laughs> yeah. I'm, optimi I'm optimistic by the fact that things catch on soon enough um, to where like we're like the comedy store. You know, we're, mm -hmm. people just know we're there. Some people go to comedy once a year. Some people go once a month. We have customers that, I mean, they not every week, but they come a lot um, yeah. to the shows because they, it's they love comedy. They know we always have whether it's a famous person or a, or a showcase when they don't know any of the people's names. I always put together great shows, no matter what. So that we built that brand of hey, come out and you're gonna like the show um, for sure, whether it's again famous person or not. So I'm optimistic about the new club. I would really like for it to finally get full traction. I don't have to stress um, like I am this week about selling tickets um you know just so it it takes over like the comedy store you just know yeah. you know this is where you go for comedy it's always going to be good um here's how you buy tickets and just i don't have to i mean you still have to do marketing but um i just want to i'm optimistic about the fact that we reach that point maybe in six months or a year where we have enough people to to at least have the shows almost all full most of the time at least the friday and saturday night shows yeah it kind of reaches critical mass well there's no better marketing than being on the matt balaker podcast so That's where can right people here. Where can people learn about this? Uh, where, where can we funnel these hundreds of millions of potential customers? Uh, grandcomedyclub.com. And then our social media is Grand Comedy Club. We have some, uh, some good clips uh, on there. Some famous people, Taylor Tomlinson, Morgan Jay, um, uh, Ian Bag is going to be, Ian Bag will be, uh, he does the night before Thanksgiving, the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving every year. He does other shows during the year too, but he loves, because he lives in Long Beach. So he just drives right down. Um, so we have Ian the night before um, Thanksgiving. Uh, so our social media is great. Uh, we post a lot of clips. And so do Camille Zoltan's been sharing clips from Zoltan filmed two of his specials at our club. Um, he's filmed his last one at the Belly Up. And he's been putting clips out just recently of, of a couple of years ago when he filmed one of his specials. So, um, yeah, social media is always great. We have an email list for free. We draw some free tickets out of there on our website, grandcomedyclub.com. If you put your name and email in there, it's free to join. We we draw tickets and do discounts and, and announce names. Like uh, we have Jesus Trejo um, coming up. He sold out last time he was here six, eight months ago. He sold all the shows pretty quickly. Um, so Jesus is coming up. He's on that show, This Fool. Uh, he's a writer and he's on it uh, with Chris Estrada uh, and Frankie Quinones on, on Hulu. So um, those will sell out quick, especially because Escondido, Escondido Homes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Jesus is awesome. He's one of my favorite comedians in the world. Well, check it out. Uh, Adam. Thank you so much for joining us. you got to come back soon. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Matt Balaker podcast. To learn more, please check out mattbalaker.com.
and encourage your friends to like, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate it.